The Public Burning by Robert Coover Excerpts from the Prologue, Groundhog Hunt On June 24, 1950, less than five years after the end of World War II, the Korean War begins. American boys are again sent off in uniform to die for liberty, and a few weeks later, two New York City Jews, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, are arrested by the FBI and charged with having conspired to steal atomic secrets and pass them to the Russians. They are tried, found guilty, and on April 5, 1951, sentenced by the judge to die, thieves of light to be burned by light, in the electric chair. For it is written that any man who is dominated by demonic spirits to the extent that he gives voice to apostasy is to be subject to the judgment upon sorcerers and wizards. Then, after the usual series of permissible sophistries, the various delaying moves and light-restoring counter-moves, their fate, as the U.S. Supreme Court refuses for the sixth and last time to hear the case, locks its doors, and goes off on holiday is at last sealed, and it is determined to burn them in New York City's Times Square on the night of their 14th wedding anniversary, Thursday, June 18, 1953. There are reasons for this. Theatrical, political, whimsical. It is thought that such an event might provoke open confessions. The Rosenbergs, until now tight-lipped and unrepentant, might at last, once on stage and the lights up, perceive their national role and fulfill it, freeing themselves before their deaths from the phantom's dark, mysterious power, unburdening themselves for the people, and might thereby bring others as well to the altar, as it were, to cleanse their souls of the phantom's taint. Many believe, moreover, that such a communal pageant is just what the troubled nation needs right now to renew its sinking spirit, something archetypal, tragic, exemplary. Things have not been too good since the new war began, especially since the Chinese Reds came swarming across the Yalu and put our boys to rout. There's a need for distractions, and who knows, done right, it could bring a new excitement into the world, lift hearts, get things moving again, maybe even bring victory to the free peoples of Asia, courage to the rioting workers in enslaved Eastern Europe, fertility and tax reductions to the nation. All this is possible. And though the delays in the courts have at times perhaps been worrying, it is all coming together now in this time and place like magic. Not that Americans are superstitious, of course. How could they be? citizens of this, the most rational nation, under God, on earth. They need no omens to pull a switch, turn a buck, or change the world, for these are the elected sons and daughters of Uncle Sam, nay, Sam Slick, that wily Yankee peddler who, much like that ballsy Greek girl of long ago, popped virgin-born and fully constituted from the shattered seed pole of the very Enlightenment. Slick, as the evangels put it, as a snake out of a black skin. Young Sam, lank as a leafless elm, already chin-whiskered and plug-hatted, and all rigged out in his long-tailed blue and his striped pantaloons, his pockets stuffed with pitches, patents, and pyrotechnics, burst upon the withering old world like a Fourth of July skyrocket, snorting and neighing like a wild horse. Woo, woo, whoop! Who'll come gouge with me? Who'll come bite with me? Ralph, yuff, snort, yahoo! In the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, I have passed the Rubicon. Swim or sink, live or die, survive or perish, I'm in for a fight. I'll go to my death on a fight, and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine Protestants, a fight I must have, or else I'll have to be salted down to save me from spilling. You hear me over thar, you washed-up varmints? This is the hope of the world talking to you. I am Sam Slick the Yankee Peddler. I can ride on a flash of lightning, catch a thunderbolt in my fist, swallow niggers whole, raw or cooked, slip without a scratch down a honey locust, whoop my weight in wildcats and redcoats, squeeze blood out of a turnip and cold cash out of a parson, and out inscrutabilize the heathen Chinese. 
So whar's that Johnny Bull to stomp his hoof or quiver his hindquarters at my proclamation? Woo woo! We love our cup of tea, boys, but we love our freedom more. So bow your necks and spread, you hot and tots. It is vain to extenuate the matter. The kingdom of sorrows a coming and the child of calamity with her. And may Great Britain rue the day her hostile bands come hither. Lo, I say unto you, I have put a crimp and a catamount with my bare hands, hugged a cinnamon bar to death, and made a grisly sing Jesus, lover of my soul, in a painful duet with his own arsehole. And I have not yet begun to fight. Yippee! I'm wild and woolly and full of fleas, ain't never been curried below the knees. So if you wish to avoid foreign collision, you would better abandon the ocean, women and children first. For we hold these truths to be self-evident, that God helps them would help themselves. It's a mere matter of marching, that idleness is emptiness, and he who lives on hope will die with his foot in his mouth, that no nation was ever ruined by trade, and that nothing is sartin but death, taxes, God's glowing covenant, enlightened self-interest, certain unalienated rights, and woods, 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 as far as the world extends. The American Autolycus, they called him in the Gospels, referring to his cunning powers of conjuration, transmutation, and magical consumption. He can play the shell game not with a mere pea, but with whole tin mines, forests, oil fields, mountain ranges, and just before Thanksgiving this past year made an entire island disappear. And it's been said that when he steps across the continent and sits down on Pike's Peak, and snorts in his handkerchief of red, white, and blue, the earth quakes and monarchs tremble on their thrones. So we must fight. I repeat it, sir. I am feeling awesome wolfy about the head and shoulders, and I must have a fight. Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of twisting noses and scrouging eyeballs and rib-breaking and massacreing. So carry the flag, you sons of liberty. Hang on to your balls and keep step to the music of the Union. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? Time is money. No pent-up Utica contracts our powers, but the whole boundless continent is ours. It's as much a law of nature as that the Mississippi should flow to the sea or that trade follows the flag. Fear is the fundament of most governments. So let's get the boot in, boys, and listen to him scream. Let us animate and encourage each other. Whoopee! And show the whole world that a free man, contending for liberty on his own ground, can outrun, outdance, outjump, chaw more tobacco and spit less, outdrink, outholler, outfinagle, and outlick any yaller, brown, red, black, or white thing in the shape of human that's ever set his unfortunate kickers on Yankee soil. It is our manifest dust in your eye to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. So damn the torpedoes and full steam ahead, fellow ripstavers. We cannot escape history. Boliteratum we must. For our cause it is just what the doctor ordered. Logic is logic, that's all I say. And remember, if you will not hear reason, she will surely wrap your knuckles. I tell you, we want elbow room, the continent, the whole continent, and nothing but the continent. And, by gum, we will have it. And thus it was that the mighty Sam Slick, star-spangled superhero and knuckle-wrapping Yankee peddler, lit upon the Western world in all his rugged strength and radiant beauty, expounding what the disciple Rufus Choate called the glittering and sounding generalities of natural right which make up the Declaration of Independence.